Hello, I'm Cosmic Dreamer. Today, let's talk about cosmic civilization. The Earth is just a tiny dot in the entire universe. If we were to compare all the planets in the universe to grains of sand, Earth would not even count as a tiny grain. Yet, miraculously, life was born on this little blue dot and has resiliently continued for 4 billion years. What's more, it gave birth to intelligent species like humans. This seemingly insignificant civilization, humans, have estimated the age of the universe to be 13.8 billion years through the study of cosmic microwave background radiation, with an error not exceeding 20 million years. From this perspective, humans are both tiny and great. It is hard to believe that humans are the only civilization in the universe, nor should we arrogantly assume that we are the first civilization in the universe. In its 13.8 billion years, the universe may have given birth to and destroyed countless civilizations. The existence of humans only accounts for 0.0015% of the total age of the universe. If there are other extraterrestrial civilizations, how many civilizations would be born in the remaining 99.999985% of the time? What would civilizations look like if they have undergone development for 100 million or even 1 billion years? Have they developed to a state that we can't even imagine? In 1963, after observing the Quasar CTA-102, a former Soviet astrophysicist named Nikolai Kardashev proposed a hypothesis. He suggested that some civilizations in the universe could be millions or even billions of years ahead of us. He developed a classification system based on the notion that the status of a civilization as a whole depends principally on two elements, energy and technology, with energy being the prerequisite for technological progress. In other words, the more energy a civilization produces, the more advanced their technology is, as all civilizational development requires the usage of energy. Thus, based on energy consumption, potential levels of civilization could be hypothesized and measured. This is known as the Kardashev scale. Initially, Kardashev only defined three levels of civilization, but subsequent researchers expanded these levels to seven based on his model. Type 0 civilization is one that uses natural resources from its planet, such as wood, coal, oil, and natural gas, for energy. A characteristic feature of this civilization is that every rocket relies on chemical fuel for propulsion. In terms of civilization levels, these civilizations are akin to infants, only able to crawl, not yet ready to stand and walk. They are like civilizations, confined to their mother planet. Unfortunately, humanity is currently at the stage of a type zero civilization. Kardashev proposed a standard that calculates how much energy a civilization produces every second. According to him, lower level civilizations need to produce approximately 10 to the power of 16 watts of energy per second. The famous astrophysicist Carl Sagan suggested using a median value to create a formula to calculate the level of a civilization. In this formula, K is the Kardashev scale and P is the power in watts used by the civilization. He calculated that around 1973, the human civilization index was approximately at 0.7, as humans were using 10 terawatts of power in that year. By 2012, the total global energy consumption was 153 exajoules, equivalent to 17.54 terawatts. When this number is put into the formula, it gives a result of 0.724, Therefore, humans are currently at the level of a 0.72 civilization. The total energy use will increase tenfold for each 0.1 increase in the level, so it is quite difficult to go from 0.72 to 1. The renowned theoretical physicist Michio Kaku believes humans will need another 100-200 years to reach a type 1 civilization. And if we were to reach a type 1 civilization by solely depending on Earth's natural resources, we might not achieve it even when these resources deplete. The key doesn't lie in exploiting more fossil resources, as they will eventually run out. Instead, it is developing in two directions. The first is how to better utilize nuclear energy. Take the trending controlled nuclear fusion technology, for example. Although humans can manufacture nuclear weapons, this doesn't imply that we can transform them into energy. Current human nuclear power plants just utilize a very rudimentary nuclear fission technology. Using nuclear fusion to produce energy requires a significant leap forward. 
Only when humans have truly mastered nuclear fusion technology and converted it into clean energy can we quickly transition to a type 1 civilization. The second is how to better utilize solar energy. Solar energy is the energy created by the constant nuclear fusion reactions in the sun's interior or at the surface sunspots. Even though the sun's radiation amount that reaches the Earth's atmosphere is only 1 2200 millionth of its total radiating energy. However, the total solar energy released to Earth every second is like 35,000 times the world's total yearly energy consumption. But the direct conversion of solar energy into photothermal, photovoltaic, and photochemical energy is a problem. Furthermore, solar energy's low energy density poses another challenge, how to collect and store it effectively. Therefore, significantly enhancing the utilization rate of solar energy is the key to crossing over to a Type 1 civilization. A Type 1 civilization, also known as a planetary civilization, can use and store all available energy on their planet, including wind, water, solar energy, and any other form of energy that can be harnessed on the planet. Of course, this doesn't imply depleting all the resources on the planet, but utilizing the energy that could be produced from all the resources the planet has. That is, whether it can produce 10 to the 16th power of watts of energy per second. This type of civilization can exploit all available resources on their mother planet, cleverly harnessing the entire world's energy output. Reaching a Type 1 civilization at least requires mastering controlled nuclear fusion technology, the efficient use of clean energy, like solar, wind, geothermal, tidal energy, and popularizing these energy technologies. They could move freely in the deep sea, the Earth's interior, and near Earth's orbit. They could artificially control geological, atmospheric, marine activities, the biosphere, and other natural existences. Their understanding of the microcosmic field must also be furthered. A Type 1 civilization no longer needs fossil fuels. As they're finite and unsustainable, the ongoing natural processes on the planet, such as sunlight, wind, and tides, would replace them. This applies especially to the harnessing of solar energy. For instance, the concept of space-based solar power proposed by NASA. It involves placing giant solar energy collectors in Earth's orbit. There's no atmospheric diffusion here, so efficiency multiplies, and there's no impact from nighttime. If a highly efficient method of converting solar energy into electrical energy is obtained, acquiring energy would be as simple as acquiring oxygen at this point. Rockets of a Type 1 civilization no longer use chemical fuels, as there is a speed limit for chemical fuel rockets. Breaking the third cosmic velocity and escaping the solar system would be impossible without gravitational slingshots. Therefore, a Type 1 civilization won't use such inefficient thrusters. Instead, they will use lithium-ion thrusters, positron-catalyzed nuclear fusion thrusters, and photon rocket engines, allowing them to easily exceed the third cosmic velocity. But the acquisition of energy is just one manifestation of reaching a Type 1 civilization. This can prevent entering the next ice age. They would also be able to set the weather with high precision. Weather forecasts would become as accurate as episode previews. Furthermore, it will globally coordinate rainfall, allowing arid areas to freely control rainfall. Humans have cured most diseases, and lifespan will be further enhanced, reaching the limit of natural lifespan, which is about 150 years. Humans will also construct various living facilities in the sky, ocean, and underground. Human footprints will be found throughout the major planets and satellites of the solar system. There will also be transformations of Mars and Venus to make them suitable for human habitation outside of Earth. At this stage, humans begin to officially make contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. All alien civilizations that have openly come to Earth will establish initial diplomatic relations and start to understand that there are evil alien civilizations in the universe. Due to fear of these evil civilizations, Voyager is still within the sun's gravitational pull at this time. Humans will use more advanced detectors to catch up and destroy Voyager. At the same time, they will no longer actively send radio signals to deep space. Michio Kaku believes that it will take humans about 3,000 years to reach the full technological level of a Type 1 civilization. A Type 2 civilization is a stellar civilization. 
it can control the total energy of the star it inhabits. We know that stars are the largest source of energy in their galaxies. When the planet or even all the planets and satellites of a Type 1 civilization cannot satisfy the energy needed for its advancement, the star becomes their next energy source. Freeman Dyson, a renowned American theoretical physicist and Einstein's former assistant, believed in 1959, any technological civilization has a steady growth in energy demand. If human civilization can last long enough, there will inevitably be a day when energy demand will expand to use the entire energy output of its parent star. He considered it necessary to establish an orbiting structure that could intercept and collect all the energy emitted by the parent star. This is called a Dyson Sphere. A Dyson Sphere is a man-made gigantic structure that completely envelops a star and captures most or all of its energy. The diameter of the sphere will exceed 200 million kilometers. Dyson believes that such a structure is the inevitable logic of a civilization that has a long-term existence in the universe and a constantly increasing energy demand. But this is clearly illogical. Firstly, even if the entire solar system's matter was consumed, such a Dyson sphere could not be constructed. Because this Dyson sphere would first be bigger than the sun, and the sun accounts for 99.86% of the entire solar system's mass. On the other hand, the sun's huge gravity does not allow such a spherical structure to exist. So, in reality, there are three proposals for the Dyson sphere. One is called a Dyson ring. It is a ring composed of a series of star collectors. The orbital radius of this structure is one astronomical unit. The cores of the collectors are evenly distributed around the circular orbital at three degree intervals. Such a structure could utilize 1% of a star's energy. This energy amount, though, is still incredibly substantial. The second proposal is called a Dyson Swarm. It's made up of a vast number of independent structures, densely orbiting a star. All of these individual structures are produced by intelligent robots. They serve as both a star energy collector and a mini city. They provide a perfect living environment and have an inexhaustible source of energy. The third proposal is called a Dyson bubble. It's like a virtual network. Instead of using an orbiting method, it uses a large solar sail that withstands light pressure to offset the sun's gravity. Practically, this method still has problems. However, it holds potential for a type two civilization. The solar sail satellite orbiting the parent star needs a total density of 0.78 grams per square meter which is only equivalent to the mass of the asteroid Pallas. In theory, if a sufficient number of solar sail satellites are manufactured and deployed around the star, it can form a non-fixed Dyson bubble. This structure doesn't suffer from the disadvantage of being affected by enormous pressure, nor does it need to reach the supermassive mass required by a fixed Dyson shell. It can also absorb most of the star's energy. However, the downside is, that this shell has the same optical and thermodynamic properties as a fixed Dyson shell and can be detected by other cosmic civilizations through similar methods. Because solar energy collectors absorb and re-radiate the star's energy, the wavelength of the radiation from the collectors depends on their temperature and the emission spectra of the materials. As the collectors are most likely to be made of heavy elements which are uncommon in this star's spectrum, Therefore, this star system might radiate an unconventional type of spectrum, which could be observed by other civilization. In 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope, used to search for exoplanets, was launched. It used a method called transit photometry to precisely monitor the brightness of over 100,000 stars in the constellations Cygnus and Lyra. In September 2015, a star in the Cygnus constellation known as Tabby's Star, 1,400 light years away from Earth, began to show some inexplicable behaviors. An American female astronomer, Tabitha S. Boyajian, analyzed this issue and published a detailed research paper. As the picture shows, a symmetrical and smooth decline curve appears on the luminosity curve when a normal planet passes over the surface of a star, causing the star's brightness to drop. Generally, when a planet passes by a star, the star's brightness would decrease by less than 1%. For example, when a large planet like Jupiter passes by the Sun, it only causes the Sun's brightness to decrease by 1%. However, when Tabby's star was first observed, it had dropped 15% in brightness. Upon the second observation, it had dropped 22% in brightness. 
This indicates that it's not a planet blocking the star's light, but an object with a width equivalent to half of Tabby's star. When scientists wanted to observe the brightness changes of Tabby's star for the third time, the Kepler telescope suddenly experienced a reaction wheel failure. It was eventually retired when repairs were unsuccessful. Scientists have proposed several explanations, such as cosmic dust, a swarm of cosmic comets, or a giant exoplanet collision. The latest explanation is through a method of inference. To cause such a change in brightness, there must be a planet around Tabby's star five times the radius of Jupiter, with a ring composed of a swarm of asteroids. This could cause the star's brightness to drop as much as 22% when passing by, but it still cannot explain the star's constant change in brightness. Furthermore, no such planetary state has been observed in the universe to date, so it inevitably leads one to speculate the existence of a Dyson sphere. Some have simulated this scene using cosmic sandbox software. What kind of object could it be? if 22% of the brightness of Tabby's star is obscured. This object especially resembles the colossal black spacecraft in the science fiction movie Arrival. The inconsistent brightness changes of Tabby's star suggest that this large object could possibly move around at will, recycling at different energy levels. If this is indeed a Dyson sphere, then in the Cygnus constellation, 1400 light years away from Earth, a Type II civilization should have emerged at least 100,000 years ahead of humans. Once humans reach a Type II civilization, the entire Earth will gradually unify into a whole. There will be no more limitations of nations and regions, and the concept of race will also gradually disappear. At that time, there will only be one kind of human, Earthlings. Michio Kaku believes that humans will reach a Type II civilization within 100,000 to 1,000,000 years. A Type III civilization is a galactic civilization that can control and harness the energy of its entire galaxy. Type III civilizations could likely use the same technology as Type II civilizations. But they have the capability to replicate this technology to all the stars in the galaxy. And at the center of every galaxy, there is a massive black hole that the galaxy could possibly orbit around. Therefore, this supermassive black hole could serve as the energy source for a Type III civilization. If the other end of the black hole is a white hole, in theory, a Type III civilization could also harness massive energy by collecting matter being ejected from it. A Type III civilization may have already mastered technologies such as anti-gravity propellers, quantum thrusters, interstellar impulsive engines, and hyperspace engines, which we are still in the phase of imagining. Space jump has been accomplished and travel within this galaxy has become possible. Because the spacecraft of this stage of civilization have not yet exceeded the speed of light, interstellar travel still takes a considerable amount of time. This civilization has completely cured all diseases and is seeking the possibility of immortality in various ways. Consciousness transfer, synthetic bodies, memory storage, all these can be said to provide unlimited life. However, Death cannot be completely avoided at this stage of civilization, such as when memory backups are destroyed. A Type III civilization is capable of setting up some sort of interstellar network, serving as a fulcrum for space jumps within the galaxy. It will also be aware of all the civilizations in its galaxy. However, due to the expansion of the galaxy, conflicts with other civilizations are inevitable. Therefore, interstellar wars are very likely to occur in such civilizations. A Type III civilization will join the Galactic Federation and become part of it, abiding by relevant regulations. For instance, they would not actively engage with a planet still at a Type Zero civilization, or they would observe it under certain constraints. At that time, each Type Zero civilization in the galaxy will establish a protected area, and the Type III civilization will also have the responsibility to protect these civilizations. Type III civilizations have already reached what Kardashev believed to be the limit. He felt that after reaching Type III, it was impossible to advance further, and no civilization would surpass a Type III. But the question is, if a Type III civilization is the ultimate civilization, then how did our universe come into being? In the next video, we'll continue discussing Type IV to Type VII civilizations.